As we have seen, um, the combined spirit of didacticism and of debate made the period extremely receptive to, to some genres. One of them was the essay, that this is what I um, talked about in the previous video, uh, and another genre that, um, that works well with these, um, with these two concepts is satire. Satire indeed becomes the most successful art form of neoclassicism uh, in the 18th century, less so in drama, um, but especially in poetry and also in prose. The foremost authors uh, for satire, particularly in the first half of the 18th century, were Alexander Pope and Jonathan Swift, whom you see here again, and all of the examples will be drawn from, from these two authors. Um, Pope uh, was particularly noted for satire in, in, in poetry and Swift in prose. Um, the tradition of satire is carried unbroken into neoclassical literature from the Jensonian tradition um, of um, satire on the stage um, through the Restoration satire also um, on the stage. But um, 18th century um, satire under the spirit of enlightenment is often more optimistic, more good natured and less nihilistically self-ironic than, than certainly restoration satire could be. The, the idea here is, is more in the spirit of, of debate and, and of improvement um, that um, the satirist is laughing his audience into sins. Um, so you, you laugh at your own follies, but um, in a way that makes you realize your mistakes and say, oh, okay, I, should, I guess I should change that and, and become uh, better. We could see this exemplified very nicely in, in one of the classic texts of um, 18th century um, satire and poetry, uh, Alexander Pope's poem, um, The Rape of the Lock. Now, the, the, the subgenre that this um, uses is the so-called mock heroic, um, also called mock epic or heroic comic. Um, and that's um, usually a satiric or parodic um, form that uses um, classical stereotypes of heroes and of heroic literature and pokes some usually good-natured fun at it. Uh, typically, mock heroic works to insert the heroic qualities by either putting a fool in the role of the hero or by exaggerating the heroic qualities to such a point that they become absurd, um, that the hero will, will do something in a very normal circumstances that is then celebrated as this great heroic feat, or to have, on the other hand, have sort of a, a fool, foolish character. Um, Dryden's McFleckno, I, I quoted that um, in an earlier video, um, that's sort of the, the, the locus classicus of this, this type where you have um, this, this heroic framework that is all about crowning the the king of um, stupid poets, and you have this this very stupid poet poem uh, a poet who is um, who is crowned in this way. Um, Pope wrote the Rape of the Lock um, in two versions. First of all, in 1712, and then enlarged it in in 1714. And um, the 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 text had a supposed real life incident as its origin, um, because during a social occasion in 1711, a young peer, um, Robert Lord Peter, snipped off a lock of hair from the head of the young, beauteous and distant relation Arabella Firmer, who in the poem is, is referred to as Belinda. So he cut off that lock and, and got away with it. And that caused an uproar and that caused a twist between the two branches of the family. So supposedly someone came to Pope and said, well, can't you write about this in kind of a humorous deflating manner, uh, make a little bit of fun of, uh, uh, of it, and then we can all laugh about it. And this is what Pope sets out to do. Um, so the, the, the rape of lock fuses classical and Christian resources in this mock heroic manner, um, that is both playful and satiric um, in that he describes this act of cutting off the lock in such overblown uh, heroic terms that you can't but laugh at, at the, uh, the ridiculousness of it. Uh, he describes it in the beginning of the poem as what dire offense from amorous causes springs, what mighty contests rise from trivial things. Right? This, is, this is the mock um, 
heroic after all. You have these trivial things that, that, that get blown out of proportion and you mirror that in your, in your writing. We can see this, for example, here in, in the scene when the lock actually gets cut. You here have an illustration uh, of that, and this is this is the these are the lines that describe the the cutting, the meeting points of the of the scissors, uh, the meeting points, the sacred hair dissever from the fair head forever and forever. Then flash the living lightning from her eyes, and screams of horror rend the affrighted skies and so on and so forth. So this is all very um, playful and, and, and enjoyable. Um, of course, if, if that was all, um, then the, the poem would be merely a historical curiosity. But of course, uh, Pope transcends this original purpose in his, in his text, uh, because it becomes also a satire on the contemporary society, uh, which showcases the lifestyle led by the upper class of the people. So he, he makes fun of the whole society that he describes in, in this way, and it becomes uh, a, a satiric portrait of, of society. Pope arguably um, satirizes society, uh, but rather by being part of it than standing outside and, and looking down on his fellow human beings. So he, he does um, he, he has sort of a half outside position. He was all of his life um, not really in the center of uh, of social life, partly because he all of his life was a Catholic, and that was a very difficult uh, place to be in 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 his time. Uh, for example, he could not he could not own a horse. He could not have um, he could not live within uh, five miles of the city. So he had to buy a house outside of London, and and so on. Uh, but yet at the same time, he managed to become the foremost poet of his age uh, and he was celebrated and courted. So he really had sort of this ambiguous inside, half inside, half outside um, position. Um, for a different reason, um, the other great satirist of the early 18th century, Jonathan Swift, um, also was uh, an outsider, um, remained an outsider. Um, he was Anglo-Irish by birth, um, so he wasn't a Catholic, but he came from, from Ireland and he, um, he tried to gain a permanent position in the church. He was a churchman um, and, that, and he failed to do that. He, he went to London um, for many years, uh, had, a, had a very close relationship, um, friendship with, with Pope uh, and tried to get a post at a, um, somewhere in the church. Uh, and, and failed to do that partly because Queen Anne was so angered by one of his satires that she says, this person is never going to get uh, a position in a church where I have something to say. And that was the, the Church of England, of course. So the only thing that he could do was go back to Ireland and get a position in the Church of Ireland. And this he did um, by becoming the Dean of, of St. Patrick's Church, which you see here um, as well. Um, he wasn't happy with that. Uh, he, he really wanted to live in England uh, and in London. Um, but when he came back, um, he was also sympathetic with um, the situation of, of the Irish, particularly the, the, the Catholic majority, which was uh, basically a, a colonized uh, nation um, that was dominated by, by the Anglo-Irish. So he sympathized with the Irish to a, to a, a rather uncommon degree um, and sympathized with this uh, the suppressed. You see this here. Uh, for example, in this quote from the, 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 the famous Drapier's letters that, that uh, provoked um, a kind of a rebellious spirit in, in, in Ireland. For in reason, all government without the consent of the governed is the very definition of slavery. But in fact, 11 men well armed will certainly subdue one single man in his shirt. So it's just a, the, the, the uh, superior force that, that subdues um, the Irish in, in this way. So. Um, Swift was indignant, an indignant observer of the Irish nation's um, exploitation. In his eyes, the Irish were being eaten alive by their English rulers, who basically tried to get out as much as possible of the land without giving anything back. Very often you had these absentee landlords that had large lands um, that they got as much money uh, as possible, but they wouldn't even live in Ireland or care in any way about um, the Irish. Um, so. Um, his, the pamphlet um, that I want to introduce, The Modest Proposal, basically takes this metaphor um, and advocates it with a deadpan 
literalness. So we know it as, as, as a modest proposal usually, but the full title of the text is a modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people from being a burden to their parents or country and for making them beneficial to the public. So the, the genre that Swift imitates here is that of the proposal. And this was, I mean, the, this is the enlightenment. This is the age of people having great ideas and people trying to improve society, improve sciences, improve economics and so on. So they, they would write these, these proposals. So Swift uh, satirizes by, by making sort of a parody pr proposal. And the proposal, of course, is that the children of the Irish poor should be fattened until they are one year old and then butchered and eaten. And there is a, it's a short text, it's only 10 pages long. Um, and these are 10 pages of dispassionate economic argument in which Swift advances his proposals um, and, and rationally lays out the rules for that. And, and these 10 pages have remained probably the most shocking pages in English literature and, and certainly one of its foremost examples of, of irony. Um, for example, the, the, the um, narrator writes, I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a healthy young child, well nursed, is at a year old, a most delicious, nourishing and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked or boiled. And I can make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragu. Um, and, and he goes through with with this and, and never sort of um, lets slip out that this is a horrible thing. Um, and it, it seems very natural um, as he describes um, as he describes the the, um, the English situation, because English landlords, as they have de already devoured most of the parents, seem to have the best title to the children. So really, they should sell. Of, of course, this isn't for the Irish poor. Um, they shouldn't eat their own children, but rather they, they will sell it to the rich um, who, because they have eaten everything else, uh, will now also eat um, the children. Um, as he writes, England is a country which would be glad to eat up our whole nation without salt. Um, and and this is of course it's um, it's it, it's horrible it's terrible um, and 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 when you read it you scream no this is really terrible but the uh, the great thing about this is how how deadpan Swift keeps his persona um, enumerating um, and, and calculating how this is really the best best uh, way to go and, and 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 all of the benefits that that you would reap from that um, so really the the point isn't um, even so much this to, to literalize this this metaphor of, of England eating up um, Ireland, but rather to show the inhumanity of that kind of thinking, um, because you can't poke rational holes into the argument. It's only that you know it's wrong, um, but you can't make a, a real rational argument against this. So in a way, um, the, 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 the speaker um, not so much the the problem, the disease that that Swift wants to to diagnose isn't really addressed by the speaker so much as embodied by it. But the, the very solution that he that he gives us is is so terribly wrong. So we can we can see here um, that already right in the middle of of um, this um, enlightenment um, thinking and writing, um, we have voices that, that question the, the supremacy of rationality, whether that is something that is always only for the good. And here you have a perfectly rational um, human being that describes something that is just so uh, abhorrent and against anything that we would believe in. So definitely read The Modest Proposal. This is certainly a good um, entry into um, the world and the, 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 the type of humor that, that Swift um, stands for. But obviously, uh, the text that um, is mostly associated with him and that is one of the cornerstones of 18th century satire is his um, book Gulliver's Travels, the most successful and famous example. Um, the text that everybody knows, I guess, probably nobody has read it in the original. There are countless um, versions, adaptations, many of them geared towards children. So be aware, this is definitely not a children's book. It was never meant as a children's book. Um, and there is a lot in it that is that is not for children. It was published first published in um, 1726, and it was an instant hit. It is actually one of the top three sellers of 
the 18th century. So very successful in its own time. Um, but also we should be aware that um, this isn't a novel. Uh, it's usually sort of grouped under novels nowadays, but it is not yet um, really uh, what we would consider a novel. Um, one of the differences is um, the character. We have um, Gulliver, of course, as a main character that leads uh, through the, the four parts, but he isn't a consistent psychological character. He's not meant to be that. In fact, it's one of the points is his, his inconsistency that is uh, part of the satire, as we, we will see. Also, it relies mainly on the model of the travel account. Um, so it's basically just these four accounts of these um, travels. Um, and there is no attempt to create one overarching um, narrative um, story, uh, but rather you have a, a series of, of episodes. Uh, the main structure organization is, of course, the four books. Um, you have these four different parts um, with different satirical targets. Um, so they're, uh, in terms of content, there are travels to different places, um, but they all have different satirical targets. The most well-known, of course, is the first one, um, the, the, the travel to Lilliput, this island where um, human beings are just you know, so very, very, very tiny. And we, we all know this iconic image of, of Gulliver waking up after a shipwreck and, and being tied down in, in this way. Now, book one is um, a political satire, a topical political satire. So that means that it makes fun of the very concrete political uh, and religious feuds of its, of its time. Um, basically, every character in Lilliput can be identified as a, a person that really exists in England uh, or France at, at the time. And it, 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 it makes these concrete allusions um, to things. I'm just gonna give you one example here of how that works. So let's look at this passage here. Um, this is described by, uh, by one of um, the Lilliputians. It is allowed on all hands that the primitive way of breaking eggs before we eat them was upon the larger end. But his present majesty's grandfather, while he was a boy, going to eat an egg and breaking it according to the ancient practice, happened to cut one of his fingers. Whereupon the emperor, his father, published an edict commanding all his subjects upon great penalties to break the smaller end of their eggs. The people so highly resented this law that our history tells us there have been six rebellions raised on that account, wherein one emperor lost his life and another his crown. Now, the, the breaking of the, the egg is usually understood, understood to be um, referring to um, the doctrine of transubstantiation, that is the question of whether um, at mass um, the wine that is given to the congregation actually turns into the blood of Jesus or only symbolically, but it also signifies, of course, the difference between Catholic and Protestant. Um, so this is what it's referred to. So the, um, the, the, the strive that comes out of that, um, where one emperor lost his life, that is, of course, Charles I, um, who was executed in um, the Civil War in 1649, and another, his crown, uh, that is then later in the Glorious Revolution, um, when the king is, is sent into exile. So we see that, that this, this ridiculous story of breaking the eggs um, behind that is um, is this. So it, it makes fun of of, of um, many of the events um, and, and and politics, but also religious um, strives of of its of its own time. Book two is the voyage to Brobdignag. Um, so in contrast to the first one, where the Lilliputians are very small, um, so that. Gulliver will appear as this giant. Now he is in a land of actual giants where he is minuscule and, and very small. Um, in terms of satire, um, book two is concerned with morality. It uses the ancients versus moderns um, debate and has um, um, as one of the central characters um, the so-called philosopher king, the king of Brobdignac. And um, here Gulliver um, talks about his own country um, and then um, the king comments on this, and, and these comments are usually unfavorable, um, particularly when we look at the, the, the final verdict that he comes to. 
which is this that he says, I cannot but conclude the bulk of your natives to be the most pernicious race of little odious vermin that nature ever suffered to crawl upon the surface of the earth. Um, so um, that shows us very clearly how um, um, Swift broadens the, um, the scope. So it's now it's not merely the politics of England at the time, but rather uh, the political systems, um, the systems of morality, judi uh, judicial systems, and so on, that are being questioned and, and being condemned here. The third book, uh, probably the least well-known one, is mainly a satire on, on science, uh, on the academy, uh, but also has weird things like flying islands, which you can see here. Um, so it's, it's, it's a strange book um, that, that sort of, again, broadens the scope to include uh, other aspects of contemporary society. Throughout his text, Swift uses perspective as his main theme. Uh, in the first two books, Gulliver himself is the wrong size, uh, and Swift in, in exploits the possibilities of Gulliver's inevitable difficulty in, in perceiving what's going on in, around him. In Lilliput, where Gulliver is so much bigger than anyone else, um, he has an exaggerated sense of his own importance and in the correctness of his understanding. So he, he feels, he, he looks down, he literally looks down on these people. Whereas in Brobdignag, where he's so much smaller, Gulliver struggles to make everyone take him seriously. And this microscopic vision also provides him with a, a deflating perspective on, on humans, particularly on, on human corporeality, on, on, on bodily matters. Just look at, um, at, at um, a passage like this one here. Um, now he des he's describing these, these huge gigantic people, so he gets a little bit too close for comfort to them. There was a woman with a cancer in her breast, swelled to a monstrous size, full of holes, in one, in two or three of which I could have easily crept and covered my whole body. There was a fellow with a wen in his neck, larger than five wool packs, in another with a couple of wooden legs, each about twenty foot high. But the most hateful sight of all was the lice crawling on their clothes. I could see distinctly the limbs of these vermin with my naked eyes, much better than those of a European louse through a microscope, and their snouts with which they rooted like swine." Ooh. So Swift is, is, is toying with perspective here, but um, as I said, the, the, the main character isn't a consistent pers person, um, but rather sort of employs these wrong visions, first in, in, in Lilliput and then in Brobdignag, and we are dragged along um, with him, and 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 we're sort of led into these these um, skewed perspectives, uh, and he makes it very clear how how Gulliver's how, how Gulliver isn't a trustful uh, trustworthy uh, person in, in in his accounts because he lets him, his own perspective be so skewed. So this is uh, Gulliver coming back um, from um, from one of his travels. When I came to my own house, for which I was forced to inquire one of the servants. Uh, inquire, one of the servants opening the door, I bent down to go in, like a goose under a gate, for fear of striking my head, because he thinks he's so so large still um, compared to everything else. My wife ran out to embrace me, but I stooped lower than her knees, thinking she could otherwise never be able to reach my mouth. My daughter kneeled to ask me blessing, but I could not see her till she arose, having been so long used to stand with my head and eyes erect to above sixty foot. And then I went to take her up with one hand by the waist. I looked down upon the servant and one or two friends who were in the house as if they had been pygmies and I a giant. Um, so he can't readjust his, his, um, his vision. And that's a, 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 an in clear indicator that we should be wary of, of taking everything that he says for granted. And this, this becomes, of course, uh, majorly important um, with the fourth book. Because the fourth book really, really is the point where where readers have traditionally parted ways, and 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 some of them had think this is sort of the culmination of of satire, um, and others have said, okay, now I see Swift is mad, and this this is just this is just trash. Um, because as I said, he is he's widening, he's further widening the scope of the satire, and now he's not only talking about. Um, in particular um, political parties or people, 
nor is he just talking about um, systems of government, um, social system, but now he's talking about humanity in general. And he does that by um, this, this, his vision of this land of the Huinims, that's these horse-like creatures, and the Yahoos. Um, so he meets these creatures, and the horses are um, rational creatures, thinking creatures, they can talk, um, whereas the Yahoos, who are sort of human-like, ape-like, they are um, absolutely mean, um, instinctual, um, terrible um, creatures, uh, and he, he builds up that, that, that um, opposition between these. Um, so Gulliver um, comes to the Huynims, he becomes, um, so if they, they take him in, um, they, he learns his lang their language, and he, he starts to talk to them, and he sees them as these superior beings, because they're not just rational, they're hyper-rational, they're absolute pure rationality. Um, they're a little bit like, like the Vulcans in, in, in Star Trek, that they, they actually have um, uh, trouble understanding anything that isn't absolutely perfectly um, rational. Um, and, and Gulliver's torn between wanting to be like a Huynim, but also seeing that he, he ha if he isn't a Huynim, he, he must be a Yahoo, and that's the way that the Huynims also see him. Um, and he, he isn't able to see that he could be something in between, something that is not as base and instinctual as the Yahoos, but also not as perfectly rational as um, the, the Huynims. And that makes him kind of despair of, of humanity in general. So when it comes to the fourth book, there are really sort of two two schools of reading it: the hard and the soft um, reading. The, the the hard reading would say that that Swift and Gulliver basically agree about how terrible humanity is, and that um, the, the the last thing that we see of of Gulliver, who who has come to hate all of humans and who actually can't stand their smell, so he stops his nose with tobacco because he can't smell humans anymore because he only thinks that they are. Um, like like the terrible smelly yahoos, that this is really Swift. Swift is has sort of gotten mad and 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 really hates all humanity. And really, in the fourth book, um, there isn't a lot of light left at the end of the tunnel. The description of humanity is 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 really very very negative. Um, when when Gulliver describes how he lives in 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 Huynim society, he says. Here I did not feel the treachery or inconstancy of a friend, nor the injuries of a secret or open enemy. I had no occasion for bribing, flattering, or pimping to procure the favor of any great man or of his minion. I wanted no fence against fraud or oppression. Here was neither physician to destroy my body, nor lawyer to ruin my fortune, and so on and so forth. So really, we come, he, he comes out of this saying that humanity is, is, is terrible. But the soft school um, says, no, we, we should not confuse uh, the main character with the author. Um, and that really what happens here is that, that Gulliver himself is also um, to, to fall for the extremeness of his vision, for his inability to see that there could be something in between and that we should not um, con completely condemn humanity, but, but rather condemn the follies within humanity. This is underscored by something that, that Swift himself um, said about his own satire. And he, um, the most important passage we have is from a, from a letter um, that he sent to Alexander Pope, where he says, I have ever hated all nations, professions, and communities, and all my love is towards individuals. For instance, I hate the tribe of lawyers, but I love counselor such a one and judge such a one. So with physicians. I will not speak of my own trade. Soldiers, English, Scotch, French, and the rest. But principally, I hate and detest that animal called man, although I heartily love John, Peter, Thomas, and so forth. This is the system upon which I have governed myself many years, but do not tell. And so I shall go on till I have done with them. I have got materials towards a treatise proving the falsity of that definition animal rationale, and to show it would be only rationis capax. So it's false to claim that man is the rational animal, that man is rational, and it would be more appropriate to say he's capable of reason, but only if he, he's actually willing to use his, his, his reason. 
So we see that right in the midst of the Enlightenment um, and, and, and uh, fueled by the uh, belief in, in debate and rationality, we also have this um, not questioning of rationality in, in itself, as we had it on the restoration stage, but rather um, telling us not to be overconfident in our rationality and to see how much of the Yahoo there is still left in us and how much um, there is still to improve after all.